So the hacking and the modding scene around the Nintendo Switch has picked up a lot of steam over the past, well, year. Everyone's pretty much been looking at it, trying to get it hacked, uh, homebrew loaded on it, and for the most part, they've pretty much figured it out. There's even a point now where a homebrew launcher is being, well, completely teased by some of those people who are data mining and doing workarounds to get homebrew on this stuff, which is pretty exciting for some people. I think the vast majority get kind of nervous or, or annoyed at these things because it could affect console sales or at least game sales. Although, what we're going to talk about today is not going to affect most of you. A very small amount of people will probably follow through on this, but I think it's very interesting to talk about, and it, I think it is something that Nintendo is definitely keeping an eye on, they pretty much have to. After seeing what the PSP went through, whenever you hear about one place, one company, one group hacking a system or figuring out a workaround that could eventually lead to piracy, I think that parent company has an obligation to pretty much figure out how to stop this. And it's going to be interesting here because Team Executor is coming to the table with some very, very big claims. Claims that say you can mod, you can hack any Switch, no matter what firmware it's on. Now, if you don't know, there was uh, a convention or a conference that took place where all of those people that I was just telling you about went to and they presented their findings. I was tweeting about it when it was going on. I didn't really think to stream it because I didn't think it would be super interesting to everyone, but they kind of went down the list as to how they went about hacking the Switch, but then they always came to the same conclusion. If you leave uh, firmware 3.0, you can no longer hack the system with their method. Nintendo quickly patched that, more than likely after somebody spilled the beans and let them know how to fix it. Or maybe they found it themselves through testing. Either way, they are actively patching any bit of software that could lead to piracy or a homebrew or just unsigned code in general being written and run, and run on the system. But at this conference, they went through it all. They told, they told everyone how they did this. But again, that conclusion kept popping up. 3.0 is the barrier. You go past that, you're done. You can't load any of this stuff. You can't use our methods to load, load homebrew. So Team Executor decided to post pretty much the, the, a day or two afterwards. It's actually on January 2nd when they posted this and they pretty much say, hey guys, we got it figured out. This is what they said in their blog post. This solution will work on any Nintendo Switch console, regardless of the currently installed firmware, and will be completely future-proof. This is the solution for opening up custom firmware on the Nintendo Switch. We want to move the community forward and provide a persistent, stable, and fast method of running your own code and custom firmware patches on Nintendo's latest flagship product. And we think we've succeeded. Now from there, they show a video that shows the Executor logo popping up while the Nintendo Switch is booting. Now I don't think this is any, I, I don't think it's any real proof. Now people are saying that they have pretty much unlocked the bootloader and that's why they can do this kind of stuff. But I have a feeling they probably could have done this on an older firmware for the most part, something three or below, or even I guess three and 3.0 and written like their own code to make that happen. However, what they are suggesting here is that there is a way outside of software to allow you to bypass any security measures and run your own code. And you may be asking, what are they, how are they doing this? I think it's pretty clear. We're talking about Team Executor here. And they are well known, and I'll explain this a little bit to you, for hard mods. Now hard mods mean you're probably using something like, for example, a mod chip, where back in the PS1 days, remember people were getting their systems chipped, as we would say, you'd send it away, somebody would put a mod chip in, and now all of a sudden you can run backups, like you'd be able to burn CDs, which believe it or not, back then CDs were still kind of uh, expensive. If you had a CD burner, you were, the, you were the cool kid on the block. You were the one that everyone went to because they wanted you to burn their, uh, their music CDs. But that was a thing. You could technically burn games to, to disc and then run it on your PS1. I like to assume a lot of people did this so that they could play, uh, uh, you know, region locked games like Japanese games, stuff like that. But we all know most people probably burn games after this happened. It was an expensive service. It wasn't one you were doing at your house. Like I said, you were sending it away. So the vast majority of us did not get our systems chipped and obviously did not affect PS1 sales in the long run. The 360 was a, one of the most hacked systems by Team X here. Now they, they really, I remember they became really Really popular with the original Xbox, but man, did they become popular with the 360. They had a few different methods. I remember JTagging became very popular, but then I remember they did the reset glitch that essentially you'd put a board into the system, you'd take the system all the way apart, solder wires all over the place, a little chip in the back, you'd usually uh, put it right on top of the AV port, boom, and you'd glue it to that. But what this would do is pretty much send pulses during the startup operation to then take control of the system and allow it to run custom firmware. It would boot up, and it was pretty cool. 
it opened up the system completely. I remember doing it and I loaded up as like a main machine because it worked really well with coin ops. Look up coin ops, by the way, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's awesome. And uh, I would also load it on original Xbox systems as well. That's probably the easiest system to get it all loaded onto, although you have to change a hard drive out. Anyway, I'm getting off topic here. The system for the Switch is probably going to have some sort of board that actually gets soldered into the system. So you're going to open up the Switch like I've done a million times. You're going to solder a little board in and then you're going to in some way program it or run a set of steps to then take control and load your firmware. You then probably leave the chip in there because it interrupts the startup operation. Now, is this something that will affect sales overall? Probably not. You're, not, you're probably not going to get this board for the most part break your switch apart, solder it all in, and then close it up and then program it. Most of us will not do it. I'd say 2% at the most will do this, but this is something Nintendo wants to look into because it's still people tampering with their system. Now you might be wondering, well, how can they fix this? What are they gonna do? It's a hard mod. People are opening the system. They're soldering wires, doing all this stuff. There is, There are some things they can do. And really, I don't know if Microsoft did this on purpose. I have a feeling they did, but the easiest way to counter this it's to change the board completely. And Microsoft went through a ton of revisions with the 360. I think it had a little bit to do with the system pretty much failing constantly. So they kept going to a lower power profile, kept shrinking the chip, shrinking the chip, and trying to make it so it didn't put off as much heat. But there were like so many, there was like a Xenos board, there was a Falcon board, and you always had to check the power plug. <laughs> I remember doing this. We'd always check the power plug and be like, all right, it's a Falcon board. I can do that one. Or it's, 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 I, I'm trying to remember some of the different boards, like Opus board. It basically got to a certain point, and you're like, I can't chip that one. We can't do it. But then reset glitch came around and you could do it to everything, including the Slim 360. That was the most popular one to do it to. But at a point in time, you couldn't keep JTAGging systems because the boards kept changing. So what Nintendo should be doing and should be thinking about this now, if they haven't already, is to eventually change the board so that it's, it's different and you don't have the same solder points and maybe they set up fuses here and there to affect uh, that what Team X here is doing. I'm gonna tell you now, Nintendo's gonna order one of these boards in some way and they're gonna figure it out uh, reverse engineer it in their R&D division, and they're going to figure out, all right, where do they pull, where do they send these pulses, how do they override this system security, and then they're going to put out a different revision, and it's going to be very difficult to see which one it is, unless it's printed on the bottom for firmware. So this is more an interesting thing. I wouldn't look at this and say it's over, you know, it's going to turn into the PSP because the PSP was badly hurt by piracy, whether you believe that or not, it absolutely was. Nintendo knows, other companies know, you have to lock down your system. This is less of a big deal because it's not a software mod. It's not something you load up your, your, your program that then uh, takes over the system. No, you have to do some serious work. And sure, you might pay 200 bucks to get it sent away and get it chipped, but the vast majority of us will not do that. It's just, it's headache, it's time, and even then when you get it back, you still might not understand how to make this work. So more than likely, Nintendo will do this for security reasons because there could be some serious stuff that could be pulled from it, some serious exploits that could be discovered even when custom firmware is being run on it. You can usually then start pulling things off of it and try to figure out other security glitches or, or hacks or stuff. So they will more than likely revise the board as we go forward just to fight this type of, uh, really th this type of hacking. I wouldn't expect any major, and the other point to bring up here, before we finish up here, is that Team Executor makes promises that they don't always keep. We're still waiting for our Xbox One exploit. They were they were talking, I remember a while ago, about how they, they cracked the Xbox One. We'll be able to do all this stuff with it, and we're still kind of waiting for that. So, even though they're, they're teasing a spring 2018 release for this, I don't know if it's really going to happen. I wish I could tell you it absolutely will, just so they can get on with it and it won't be hanging over Nintendo's head forever. It might not even happen. The, the video they could be showing is just from, say, a startup from a, an already hacked system that's 3.0. And that's how they're showing us this example. So don't really come in here thinking that it's absolutely going to happen. Because Team Executor hasn't always been transparent. They've never, they haven't always lived up to their promises. I'll say that. Anyway, guys, I appreciate you watching the video. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, guys. Hit the dislike if not. And let me know all about this situation here. Or maybe you're excited for the idea of being able to hack any firmware. Maybe you're a big fan of kind of tinkering with these systems, kind of like I am. Um, I never really got super into the hacking scene except for the original Xbox. That was my favorite system to hack. But uh, I never really got into it with any of the newer systems. I mean, these systems are kind of locked down as it is. The PS4 just recently had its kernel exploited and the Xbox One is basically a Windows computer. So there's not much to really do there, I guess. But, I mean, loading, like, Linux onto the Switch or even the <laughs> Windows, I guess, Linux would be more interesting. Um, but we're starting to see that with the PS4 where they're maybe thinking about loading Linux. But let me know if you guys are a big fan of, of systems getting hacked, getting unlocked, getting opened up. 
because there could be all kinds of cool stuff. I mean, think about the Switch. It's one of the most powerful systems right now that is a portable system. So consider that when that gets opened up, man, the possibilities are endless with this thing. I love the PSP when it got hacked because it was so cool. People even loaded Windows 95 on that thing. I remember that, but this could be really interesting. However, it could also hurt Nintendo, so they need to be, like, seriously vigilant about this. Get it figured out and start revising your board to kind of avoid this because it's, it, it could eventually affect it, although I just don't think enough people will buy into this. Guys, let me know what you think down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>